Welcome to the Get Offset Podcast. My name is Andrew. And I'm Emily. And joining us today is... <laughs> Devon Blue Whitaker. <laughs> that was Andrew, you're clipping so hard. Oh, am I? Did I get too excited? I'm going to dial back the gain a little bit here and maybe sit back for the mic and uh, maybe put down the cold brew for a minute. <gasps> yeah, maybe just put down the cold brew for half a second. Yeah. <laughs> The, the, the cold brew IV that's going straight into your veins. It is Seattle, after all. Happy cold brew season. Right. See, I thought my that's... eyes were just twitching because I'm a sociopath, but nope, it's it's the cold brew. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I call that a call back to the pre-show, which we didn't record. Everybody missed everything funny. Everything. Yeah, that was all everything. the funnies I had to the day. Sorry. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Devon, where might people know you from? Um, well, um... From this channel, probably like you know YouTube or Instagram. So I do those um, pedal demos and and reviews and things like that. I'm the guy with the um, blue gloves, so mm -hmm. um, that's that's where they know me from. But you know, before all of that fun stuff, where people knew me from was um, I was a session guitar player. I got to play guitar for primarily a lot of like um like R and B and hip hop stuff. So like, you know, like um I got to play guitar on a Nicki Minaj track. I've got to be in studios with Kendrick Lamar. I've gone on tour with uh indie bands, um but um so I got to I got a chance to, to really do that for a while and um yeah, and then started the hitting the uh, Instagram thing hard because, you know, I, I really wanted to um, start getting my own music out there. You know, it's not um, for those people who make a profession um, out of playing guitar for other artists. You know, I I envy their 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 dedication for that. It's just after a while. I just got kind of burnt out for it. It's like, you know, you, you get paid this small amount of money and you get this even smaller credit and you've helped facilitate this um, a great song and for someone else and you never really get to reap the benefits. So I took the Instagram and started making videos and back then, you know, uh, before the whole blue gloves, you know, you could see me in my entirety. Um, and, um, but yeah, that's, that's where people may know me from. Kind of yeah. Like. I mean, you have the blue gloves and usually I've seen like the red long sleeve shirt, yeah. uh, but not your face and, but also your voice in the demos. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it, it's interesting. I, 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 the first one or two demos that I did, um, I didn't, I didn't speak in them, you know, um, and I think it wasn't until like the Dr. Scientist atmosphere demo that I did that I, that I actually talked in it. And it was just because it was just out of necessity. Like it was a pretty complicated pedal and I couldn't imagine, um, like doing the entire thing in text, you know, like, um, yeah. you know, I, I watch a lot of demo videos and, and reviews and things of that nature and I've always liked it when people actually tell me something, you know. So mm -hmm. I, I did that thinking that it was a one-off, you know. Um, I was only ever going to do it for that thing. It was this big, long demo and a complicated pedal for the most part. Mm -hmm. And then I got a bunch of people telling me that they wanted to hear me speak more. And uh, the next pedal company who sent me a pedal specifically asked that I, that I talk and then it, it kind of became Aww. a thing. Yeah. So I just, I try not to do it too much, you know, but, um, there, there's considerable amount in there. Yeah. And then the, the, the gloves, is that just like a premonition of like, we're going to have a pandemic soon and better get used to it. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
it it was it was a funny th- it, it was an interesting thing. I was just as a one off. I had just got the uh, I got the OP one, and uh, I thought, oh, I want to make a fun video for this. This is back when you know I was still showing the entirety of who I am. And I thought, oh, it'd be really cool if I just got some blue gloves and did this. Well, that video ended up doing extremely well for my channel um, on on Instagram, and um, and I liked the idea of being able to put music out and not have to talk about who I was. Um, you know, I, I've got. I, I I guess I have an an interesting an interesting like look to me, and I was always more, if anything, field fielding questions more about like how I looked and who I was and why you know, and it was it was always a, a kind of thing like like that. So the blue gloves kind of uh, allowed me the opportunity to like just talk about the music like nobody asks me any personal questions like if they have any questions it's it's relegated you know exclusively to like what this song is what this piece of gear is and and just i i really liked that it felt it felt nice to be able to kind of connect with people um regarding like the arts in and of itself and not me you know like i've always had um I've never done well with lots of, uh, with, with too much, um, attention, even after shows, when we go and play live and shows and things like that. Um, Mm -hmm. I usually leave out the back door when it's all over. Um, I just don't do well (laughs) in a lot of social situations. It's just, it's a little too much for me. Yeah. No, after, after shows is always kind of such a weird, weird vibe. Yeah. You know, and it's it's weird because like um when you're up there and you're really giving it your all, you know, you're you're sweating and it's just this, you know, and you're you're a mess and you come off of stage and people are like patting you on the back, they want hugs, they want handshakes and things like that and, and rightly so. But it's just like when you're on a stage and you're really getting into it, like you're really in the zone, you know, like there is mm-hmm. nothing else, you know, there's just the zone, there's this song. And then coming off of that and, you know, coming, dropping back down into reality is a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a weird transition, you know? And I think that, yeah. um, only musicians really kind of like get that, you know, really have the opportunity to kind of escape the confines of the body, you know, and travel mm-hmm. somewhere else, you know? So it's, I don't know. Yeah. And I know that you said you're you're an introvert, and I I feel that it's so weird being on stage and being extroverted. And I just there are so many people I know who the person they are on stage is so animated and connecting with strangers, and then you know on on their own or afterwards, it's they're just exhausted because they're introverted. Um, primarily, it's just a different it's a different space for them to exist and in almost be somebody else completely if not be in a different place like you just said yeah yeah and you know to a certain degree we all kind of have you know those those facades you know and it's i don't want to say it's like you know it's theater it's playing a role as much as it is that those opportunities afford us the opportunity to be this other part of ourselves you know and it's when that moment is over then it's like you 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 have to take a break because it takes a considerable amount of energy to do that to be that person you know and Mm -hmm. uh yeah you know just you, you get to recharge your batteries when it's over yeah. And Americans and their hugs. I think one of my favorite after show moments ever was some guy came up to my singer after the show and he just like held his arms out and just like kind of looked at her, like obviously expecting her to give him a hug. And she just stares at him for maybe five, 10, 15 seconds and then just kind of shakes her head a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> just like it was a very long, very long moment. And he just was very drunk. So he just like kept him up there. And she's like, no. Like, come on, like, come on. You're going to leave on. me hanging like that? Come this on. is embarrassing for everybody. Up. But Platt just told me embarrassing for me. 
<laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. This is like, I think it was late February in Texas and like, we're, like this COVID thing was starting to kind of unfurl a little bit. <laughs> and, we're like, and also like it was a venue where I'm like, I know there's no soap in those bathrooms. Like <laughs> I'm not touching anybody. Y'all are nasty. Oh, sorry, Texas, you're not nasty. Just that bathroom at the Hotel Vegas was pretty nasty. <laughs> Texas is an interesting place. I had a gig up there um, before all of this. And um, Texas is a really weird place because, like, when you're driving into Texas, you know, it's like 500 miles, 600 miles of nothing, just just desert and, uh, you know, the first gas station, because we were, we were driving into um, Austin, the first gas station is like 300 miles in. And you start making that drive, and you're like, man, if I didn't fill up my gas tank before this, this would really not be great. Um, so 300 miles, that's, I think, about the range of my best car for gas mileage. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm probably, I'm probably exaggerating. I am exaggerating. I don't, I don't remember exactly what it was, but like it's, it, but it is, feels it's like 300 miles. Yeah. For sure. It feels like forever. Felt like it. And then, you know, and then you get to Austin and it's like, it's this, it's this beautiful place and the, the art scene is uh, blossoming. It's, it's, it's a great, great, great town for, for the arts. Yeah, I love it there. It's like an oasis in the middle of nowhere. Right. I think it would be the worst place to live, though, during the zombie apocalypse. You know, like, because they're just <laughs> like, they're just there, you know, and it's uh, around them is 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 nothing. So right, I always right. think about Ooh. things like that. Like, I, I base where I want to live off of what it would be like if there were a zombie apocalypse. So, mm -hmm. so where do you live right now, and what what's the uh, what's the zombie apocalypse scenario here? <laughs> I live in Sacramento, uh, Sacramento, California, and if the zombies were to strike, I, they would just it would it would it would really really suck. I, I'm I'm trying to move yeah. to the mountains. It's, it's what my goal is. So, I just want to get out. All of right, here. all right. Like over closer would, to uh, Tahoe or? You know, wherever I can, wherever I can go to where if guests want to visit me, they have to be helicoptered in kind of thing. <laughs> um, so Love that's it. part of the, yeah, so that's part of the problem is finding, is finding um, that type of place. Gosh, you might have to pick up some more, more gigs with Nicki Minaj then. <laughs> now in fact that was a one-off that was a crazy situation you know like um i didn't and it's and it sounds cooler than it actually was like um i get hired by um i'll get hired by like a producer for for, for a day you know and um i will just lay guitar on everything and anything that they have <clears throat> and even vocals i, I sing and um and uh some time after doing the song, you know, like I never know what's going to happen with those songs and even the producers yeah. themselves never know cuz you know they send it out to this artist, they send it out to that artist or whatever. And um I think it was like 6 months later, you know, they ended up contacting me. It was like, "Hey, we got a got a track with Nicki Minaj." And and things Ooh. like that, and uh, and I was like, "Wow, okay, cool, cool, cool." And um, and it was um, I don't even know the name of the song. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the name of the song. I just I know I got paid for it, and I know in terms of like, it's it's real value lied in being able to put it on a resume, and um, mm -hmm. you know I've had several songs like that or. or or opportunities like that, and um, it's it's a it's an interesting thing. Yeah, yeah. Session work is its own is its own thing, and it, it is weird how like you record, you go in, you record, you spend the day doing it, you get paid, you offer to to sense any changes. I mean, 
I recently did something for, for a woman and I did two sessions with her, one in a studio, one kind of like emailed it in. I said, Hey, if there's any changes you want, if you're not happy with it, just let me know. She's like, this is great. She paid me. She releases the track. I'm not on it. <laughs> I'm like, oh God. <laughs> yeah, I worked so hard on that solo. <laughs> just cut the solo completely. <laughs> That happens a lot too. And in instances like that, you know, you're as a as a hired gun, you know, you're you're thankful that you got paid. Because, you know, the reality is is the back pay on those things isn't isn't always as as great as um, you know, people imagine it to be. You know, so it's you know, because nowadays, you know, as as artists we get paid so little, you know, you, you look, you think about Spotify and things of that nature. And it's like you less than one cent, you know, less than, less than that. And uh, point I mean, three cents on Spotify on average. Yeah, exactly. And it's getting, it's getting a little bit better. Things are, things are made, make a, a, a turnaround for that. Cause now that everybody's home more, the uh, streams have kind of gone up uh, a, a little bit. I've I've released for the first time, for the first time in my life, I've released some of my own music on um, Spotify, and it's actually doing it's actually doing pretty 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 well. And it's not anything that I advertise on my my channel. I I, I don't want to be one of those guys who's just like shamelessly promoting themselves. I just uh, I like the idea of kind of putting it out there and seeing what it what it does and um i think it's and we just put out i think our first song in january we've got like two instrumentals and an actual actual song and um they're generating somewhere around like you know seventeen thousand monthly listeners and um considering we've got like i don't know we've got like 15 songs and we plan on dropping them every you know four to six weeks, you know, the, there exists the possibility that those numbers will kind of just keep increasing or, or, or whatever. But, um, yeah. So it's, um, Spotify point three, zero point three cents. Wow. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. <clears throat> Title pays twice that. That's well, true. It's not a lot of but people, a lot of people listening. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No one on I, I, I always use title because they had print stuff first. <laughs> it's like, ooh. It's like, they you can't, had, you can't uh, buy some of those records. No, no. And then they had, uh, they had Jay-Z on there and they had a bunch of other people on there. Um, they're, to... they're pretty good with the, the getting the, the music there first for, Obviously, Jay Z owns it, so getting Jay Z and Beyonce stuff is easy, and anyone in their kind of circle of of artists and all the other artists who are part owners of it. So, uh, yeah, I like. I mean, I like Title. I like that. I like their playlists a little bit better. Like their ones that like the things that they think that you might like. I, I I really dig those a lot. It's great for it's streaming's great for discovery. I still like to buy my music. Oh yeah, I still do as well. In fact, I don't for myself. I don't. I'm not a big um, patron of other people's playlists um, <clears throat> because I want to listen to what I want to listen to in the moment that I want to listen to it, and uh, I might want to listen to it twice. So um, oh, yeah. I just rather buy my own music. Uh, plus, like you know, being an artist. Um, you know, especially when we have to survive off of what we make when it, from this, you know, some of us are fortunate or unfortunate enough to, to make a living from this thing. So it's like, I don't know, when you know that you yourself, um, your livelihood is based off of selling this thing, then like, you know, you have to pay it for, you can't shortchange another artist, um, kind mm -hmm. of thing. So if I, if I really like them, I'll buy their, their album. And then I will give them a a follow on Spotify, even though like I may never go on to Spotify and really, you know, listen to things. Um, I'll still give them a follow there. And uh, yeah. yeah, I think especially people like bookers and promoters still look at 
those numbers on Spotify. I forget. I think you can drill down like analytics for where your listeners are. So I think that's helpful for tour routing, but I mean, that's like money's more helpful, generally speaking. Yeah. I mean, we still make more money for, for live, for live shows, but I mean, you know, Spotify still is a great tool for like, you know, generating that kind of passive, um, income. And if you're yeah. trying to take your music from like, you know, uh, from kind of like the whole kind of the, the indie field and may, maybe you're looking for label representation or anything, you know, a lot of those professional types, they look at things like that. They want to see, they want to, they're looking at numbers. They pull up chart metric and see what your socials look like, what your streams look like, your overall stream equity looks like. So it's, you know, it's, it's kind of the unfortunate reality um, for, for artists, you know, like you have to know a little bit about the business in order to, to make it um, as an artist. And it seems like more yeah. and more it's, it's harder it, in a lot of ways. It's easier to be an artist, but it's also, it's, it's really, it's, it's harder to, you know, just because, you know, there, there used to be a time where, you know, when you told people you were an artist, you know, there, there was a viable way to make a living off of that thing. And far more nowadays, artists are, they ride the line that's an indelible line between, you know, being an artist and, uh, you know, it, it being a hobby, you know, it, it being a profession versus it being like a pastime. So it's, it's, yeah. it's a weird thing. Not many of us get kind of break through the other side and actually make a, a living off of it or rather a meaningful living off of it. So yeah. Enough that it's like what you put on your taxes. Yeah. 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 It's I, I've always been a, a musician, but I've always been, it's always been weird to, to call myself that when it's not, you know, how I make the bulk of my income. Um, it's, which is weird because like being a musician does not necessarily mean like I'm doing this to make money. It just means I'm a person who makes music or is it, or is it, or is there a line between uh, a musician and just someone who plays music as a hobby? Well, I, <clears throat> I think that there is, I think the most important connection between like, and I think Ultimately, you're a musician, regardless of your level of dedication, you know, like, you know, I, I've said it before, you know, like, um, you can sit three people in the room, men, women in a room, who've never had any experience playing music in their life. And you give them a music instrument and eventually one of them will figure it out. One of them will figure it out. And the other two won't. You know, and it's like, why does, why is this person so different when the circumstances were the same? And it's not always um, because they were interested in it, you know, because when I stumbled into a music class some years ago, I did so because like I needed a class to transfer. I dropped the other class and the only class that would take me two weeks into the semester was a guitar class, Mr. Phillips. He told me, <clears throat> he said, if you can have a guitar and be here tomorrow, you're in the class. It was the only class that would take me. I was going to school for my degree in psychology. And uh, and I was doing it because everyone told me, like, yeah, you, you, got, you have a way with people and talking with people and understanding them. You should be a psychologist. In fact, my family was pushing for it. Um, and, um, you know, I, I got in there with zero interest and that's the most important thing, like zero interest, zero ability. It's not, it didn't run in my family. I don't, I can't trace back my lineage to people who were musicians, but I got in that class thinking like, God, I just need to just, I just need to do whatever this guy tells me to do so I can get out of this. So I can transfer. I can just get this degree, make some money. And the teacher said, he walked around the classroom, he tuned everyone's guitar, and he 
put everyone's hands into position. He says, Harry, we're going to strum our first chord today. And he's like, when I count down from the three, everyone strum. And he counted down from three, two, one, and everyone strum the chord. And there was a, a resonance that kind of bounced off of the, 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 the walls. 24 kids strumming an E minor at one time. And it opened it opened something in me. Like, for the first time in my entire life, in the entirety of my life, I knew that I wanted to, to be good at this. I, I wanted this. I, I didn't know what it was, but I wanted it. So back to what we were saying, like, you know, it's an interesting fraternity, you know, being a musician. So regardless of like, you know, the degree in which you kind of put yourself into it, whether it's at the hobby or the professional uh, level, like you are, you were created, you know, you're made or circumstances made you or the universe, whatever, whatever you believe in, you were made with the ability to do this thing that others cannot so it's it's like we're all musicians, and I think the only real deviance, like, you know, the, the only hierarchy that exists is, you know, based off of dedication. So, um, yes, you're always a musician, you know, even though the bulk of your income comes from, from some other job, you know, like you're always, you're always an artist, you know, that never stops. Um, just because you need to keep the lights on. That's really beautiful. I was just going to say the same thing. That was some really beautiful words you just laid down. Uh, oh. You sound a little choked up, Andrew. Uh, a little bit. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> it, it's It's been a weird week for my own career personally, and I don't want to get too much into that, but just kind of thinking through like to what level that my career versus my passions and uh, how that all defines me on um, has definitely been on my mind. I think that was uh, really good for me to hear. I think to to chime in, I, I, not that I could possibly follow that up with any sort of meaningful thought, uh, but in, a, in, a, in an attempt to do so, uh, thinking in terms of like the passion versus the business side of things, um, I think especially with where we're at right now economically in this region of the world, uh, it's, it's a level of necessity. I mean, uh, you were, you were talking about how it used to be a, the sort of profession where you could make a meaningful living off of, um, and ostensibly that would be without needing to do all of the business half of things yourself and keeping that business mind and being able to focus really in depth on the the artistic side of things and you know being a, a muse of sorts. Uh, well, music and, music used to be a, a craft as much in some ways as uh, painting a house was versus painting a portrait. I mean, there are plenty of people who would just like you had your 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 nightly or weekly gig, and you just went and, and you played at a dance hall, and there was that was a way to you know right. Make money. So I, just, I, mean, like, I, I that, guess my my woe and uh, my woe my complaint is. Uh, kind of just a gen generic like capitalism in a way almost makes it by elevating the ne necessity of the business side of the endeavor it doesn't guarantee that the most the the quality art the most the highest quality art comes through the other end it's the it's the most monetized most monetizationable there's a word for this Monetizable. monetizable Monetiz yeah. monetizable um art that does get throughout to the to the greater audience and then the the finer art tends to I, I in my experience tends to fall into the smaller circles uh, and doesn't get quite the same attention because of the if you've got an artist like, who's so focused on that art then i don't know uh, music can't be popular if it doesn't connect with people in some way i mean that's i think that the sort of demonization of or uh, the foo fooing popular music is just in kind of another way to, to, I mean, when you look at who primarily consumes popular music, uh, like who makes music popular, young, young girls typically. And I just think that sh crapping on uh, pop music and not that I'm saying that you're doing that, but saying it's not art to such a high degree. I don't know. It connects with people still. And 
Right. And I'm not saying that it doesn't. I, I'm just observing that there's a, a change in dynamic that muddies the water a little bit in a way that I'm not sure is desirable from the perspective of loving art for the sake of art itself. Well, I mean, the Jonas Brothers aren't John Prine or Towns Van Zandt for sure, but I mean, they connect with people and that's that's what matters in a lot of ways. John mm-hmm. Prine makes me feel feel ways and I still cry every time I hear the song Poncho and Lefty. Like I can't not cry when I hear that song. But uh I mean there there's some like I I just Oh well, I'll, I'll lay my capitalistic frustrations to rest. <laughs> well, I mean, both of you, it's interesting, though, like, it, it's, like, within the confines of what both of you said, you know, there there exists, you know, the, the, the nuances that, that, that all artists, uh, all musicians are, 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 what we have, like, that's what our, our main source of, you know, controversy is, is like, you know, the fact that there is an oversaturation of, of, of people who can be artists now, you know, like the, 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 in, the internet has kind of created this level playing field to where anyone and everyone can put something up and, and say that it, that it's art. But, you know, it's important to remember that, like, we all love McDonald's fries, but at the same time, we do want to sit down and have a good <laughs> steak. You know, it's like drawing those parallels. And yeah. <clears throat> while some artists like the Jonas Brothers and, and, and things like that, like they have a, a much larger audience, it's important to realize that like there is, there exists an audience for, for all of us, you know, and it can be that the, the size of that may vary depending on you know, your, your reach and, um, and, and things like that. And the music, you know, if it's very niche, then like, obviously the pool in which you can draw from is going to be a little bit more, um, shallower than, than say the Jonas brothers. Um, but there exists the capacity for every musician to really, really make a living out of that. And I mean, if you think about it, like if you only find, a hundred people who really love your music, you know, a hundred people, you sell an album, you know, for 10 bucks, you know, you've just, you've just doubled, you know, you make a significant amount of money from that. And like, uh, it's not, it's not a a lot, but like, it's, it's definitely something and, and a hundred people, you know, and if you never put it out, if you never did anything with it, then, no one would like it and that's the guarantee like that's the greatest guarantee that exists is that if you do nothing then you get nothing so it's i I don't know man i think it's 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 an interesting time it is a lot harder for for artists to make a living and to find their audience because of the oversaturization that that exists uh, on on art on the art field with regard to all mediums really but like it's it's there. And I think the only thing that really separates like successful musicians or artists from the ones who just find satiation with just playing on the weekend is perseverance. I, I, I wholeheartedly believe that success exists on the opposite uh, opposite side of hard work for all of us it's just you you just got to do it and i mean i'm living proof of that like i never never wanted to be a musician i had no idea i was 20 i was 20 when i picked up a guitar had every intention of getting a degree in psychology yeah i never i never wanted it as a child my my parents we lived in los angeles my parents did buy um my 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 uh, siblings and I, and there's four of us, bought us all a music instrument. I got a Casio keyboard. My uh, brother underneath me got a Casio guitar. My sister got a guitar. And then my next brother, he got a set of drums. And they just gave them to us. They said, Merry Christmas. And we were we were really young. They didn't get us any toys. We never, we, we, had kind of you know I, I wouldn't say poor upbringings but like it was one of those kind of upbringings where we got one gift each for Christmas and this was what we got <clears throat> so 
in lieu of an action figure, you, you know, I we I got a I got a Casio keyboard and I and I did not take to it. Um so eventually though, you know, coming back to it, bring the circle, um, story full circle, like um when I when I did find it, you know, I, I knew that you know, it it so it from someone who had no interest or desire into it um, and no real meaningful way of making a living off of it, like it's 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 happened for me in a meaningful way to where like doing music and doing videos is my nine to five job. Like I've been I haven't had a day job for almost three years and I've been surviving exclusively off of the arts and I've been doing that in California of all places and, and rent and everything here. It's just, it's just kind of ridiculous, but like, you know, I can still do it. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm the proof. I'm proof that like it, it can happen regardless of when you start in your life, you know? Oh yeah. yeah I that's think that... super inspirational. And I can, I can hear the passion just exuding from the words as they leave, leave your lips. Thanks, man. Yeah. And I think that our culture just really likes to focus on the people who like get started when they're young and find success when they're young. Like not that that's not to serve, but like Fiona Apple releasing her album when she was 18 or Prince releasing his first record when he was 19 and these kind of like young savant types. Um, but you don't have to be, you really don't like there are people who, do well who didn't see success until later in their lives like um Aerosmith. listen to williams as an example aerosmith yeah like they're not third eye i mean not that third eye blind is like the epitome of like the highest art i enjoy it a lot <laughs> but like they were not i think stephen jenkins was in his 30s when they hit it big in 98 or something like that like he was yeah. older and mm -hmm. i think that the uh uh, Patterson Hood from the Drive by Truckers didn't start that band until he was 30 or 31. So, yeah. like, looking at examples like that, me at 31, having just really started to to try music again, because I, I kind of fell away from it. I, I listened to some, I, I think, I don't want to say I got bad advice, but I just let it get into my head too much. Um, I had some some kind of troubled relationships with people who were you know, in the music and local, I, I dated a guy who said he would, you know, record some of my songs and just kept putting them off over other projects. And that makes you feel really bad when someone who's supposed to care about you and love you and support you keeps putting you to the wayside because you'll understand or whatever. Um, that kind of killed it for me for a long time. So just for me now, seeing how just getting back into it kind of saying screw all the insecurities and kind of fear and sensitivities that I had and just doing the thing and seeing how that's paid off in my personal and professional life just in the past couple of years. Yeah. I think that a lot of it is just about, you know, hitting the pavement, developing meaningful relationships, putting some pride into your work, being someone that people want to, you know, listen to and talk to and spend time with. Um, you know, I, I think that matters. That matters a lot. It does. It, it really does. And I mean, it's everyone thinks, and there's a misconception about it. And there's this mis the and and I've made that this misconception my entire life. The the instant I picked up a guitar and start, you know, devoting myself entirely to it, I made the misconception in believing that like one, I had to one hundred percent believe in myself and then put it out or it has to be perfect and then put it, put this out. Uh, it has to be like this and then put it out. I allow, I allowed society for so many years to be the reason why I never put anything out without realizing that, you know, maturation requires motion. Like, and once you get to a certain point with, with your, with your music, the only way for it to fully blossom and bloom and for you as an artist to develop it by putting it out there like you have to cut yeah. your teeth at putting it out there regardless of where you think it is you know the reality is like far different you know you put this song out there that you hate and i hate all my songs i do um yeah I but 
yeah but i get that feeling i like your songs (laughs) i'm so i'm so i am so glad you do but like in that and that therein lies the proof but like we as artists tend to live in our head and we allow society's rules and, and mandates to kind of infect our perspective without realizing that an artist's perspective is different. Like if we were if we were to talk about like the current social affairs and social and cultural inequities that exist in the world today, our perspective perspective of it is similar to like to, to the average person, but like we can communicate in the way that they that that they can't like just our view of the world is so different and that's why you were talking about we were talking about before all of this we were talking about how people say that they're uh, empathic you know oh um, yeah and, uh, <laughs> and that was and weird. just for everyone listening i said anyone who puts like i'm an empath in their twitter bio is a sociopath <laughs> and i said i've been accused of worse <laughs> you know and there's a psychology b- behind behind uh the things that people say but yeah no and 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 i think and i said <laughs> and i said i i think that musicians and the degree varies are empathic you know the ability to create something from nothing nothing you know it's 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 been said that you know um what is it? Uh, a painter paints a picture on canvas, but a musician uh, paints a picture in silence. Like nothing. Ooh, There's nothing beautiful. there, right? You know, yeah. like really think about it. You're you're in this room, and you've got this weird shaped box with vibrating strings, or this big bulky thing with white and black keys. And what is that, right? And you make music. And some will argue that it's music, but I, I promise you, it, it, it is always music. And that does not come from nowhere. Well, I mean, it does. I mean, maybe it's the void. I don't know. It comes but, from within. Right? And like yeah. the fact that you have the capacity to do that when others can't. Oh, no, man. Like, it's just, you have to you have to put it out there. So going back to what we were saying, it's like, you know, for some of us artists who allow society to dictate like how we present ourselves in our music, like for those who do that, you know, who allow society to to put those standards on us, this is the reason why you feel unsettled and unsatiated with like, with your own music, with your own art is because you don't realize that like, again, the way we as artists perceive the world is different. So we can't allow like the standards that exist with, with people who aren't musicians to, we can't allow those standards to infect the way we, we think, you know, like you have to put out music you have to do it and you have to do it now. I've waited too long. I waited too long to do it. I'm in my thirties now. And if I had started like, I don't know, five years ago, I'd be so much farther ahead than I am now. And I wish, I wish that I would have done it earlier. I wish I would not have listened to those things voices that you know society kind of like infected into 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 my being and i i would have just put it out there you know because the audience um loves maturation emotion they love to be able to see you know an artist who started from here and then eventually got here they want to be part of that ride you know and society like the people who are just music patrons people who love music like they love being a part of those they love being a part of those stories being like i remember him when he was playing for 15 people and now he's playing for sold out (laughs) arenas like this is their this you're affording them the opportunity to grow with you to be a part of this thing and they and they love you for it you know in most instances so it's like we as artists are only doing a disservice to ourselves and even to the to the arts in general by holding back by like retweaking this song a thousand times you know like i mean we all do it too i've done it so many times i hate so much of the music that that i have and i'm so eager but at the same time i'm really i really want to start working on new music but like what i've told myself now is like you know like 
you don't get to really work on new music until you start getting all of this other stuff out there. Like, yeah, you know, like no. we're artists. We love creating. Yeah. Right. Right. We we're, we don't like polishing something until it's just super, super shiny. Like that's not, yeah, I, I, I agree with all of that. I mean, perfection and pursuit of perfection has just sidelined so many people, myself included. Like I didn't want to start the demo channel until I was, I want to be like, I want to make sure everything's perfect. I want to do like a bunch of test runs. I want to do this. I want to do that. And finally, I'm just like, I just, I, I need to do it. I just need to do it because otherwise I'm just talking about it and planning is good, but like I need to get it to 80% and I need to ship it. Like, I, like, like trying to get that next 10% to get it to 90% to 95 to 97.2 to 98 to 99. I will never get to that 100%. And I'm so glad yeah. I just did the thing and kind of worked out the bugs as I went. And I'm still working out a lot of bugs, but I, I can't believe where I am right now, just having started this channel back in September. Wow. It's been fun. And if, I may, if I may change gears a little bit, I've got a question for my own personal curiosity and then a question that's a little bit more on topic. Sure. A question for my own curiosity is where in LA did you grow up? South Central. All righty. Mm -hmm. It was not, it was, it was not a, a, it was not a great place. It was, um, it was, it was great in the sense that, um, it prepared me for, for like a lot of the harshnesses that we're dealing with now, like the social and cultural inequities and things like that. You know, I was in Los, I lived in Los Angeles during the Rodney King riots you know, so it's like you, you live through that and you come full circle here and now, and it's like, you know, you've kind of seen that and done that, seen it, you know, been there, done that kind of thing. So it's, um, so yeah, yeah. South central Los Angeles. All right. Yeah. I, I know that area a little bit. Um, I went to, to school in the greater LA area out past Pasadena. Um, oh, okay. So I was down there for a few years and then I grew up central coast, California. So anytime I hear anybody who's from the, from the California area, I'm like, Oh, tell me more. <laughs> and then he does his California voice, which is always, <laughs> always so highly regarded. Right. <laughs> but while I'm thinking about it, while I'm thinking about it, if you would like to support this podcast, but don't want to spend money because times are weird, please leave us a five-star review and uh, stuff on the uh, the iTunes. It really helps us. Thanks. Yeah, Bye. yeah, man. Just like say something, oh. say something rad on the iTunes. You know the thing that kids are doing these days. <laughs> and rad, actually, man. I think I think I got. We must be like somewhere on some sort of like niche chart by now, Andrew, because I've been getting emails like you're charting two hundred and thirty three in the music interviews category on iTunes. You want to bump that up farther? I'm like, I'm not paying money for that, but kind of. <laughs> Speaking of support, though, uh, this week's episode of Get Offset is brought to you by Surfy Industries. Surfy is famous for making real spring reverb tanks, including the Surfy Bear Compact, which fits on your pedal board. It's not even the largest guitar pedal I own, albeit it is pretty big. It has, I mean, but it has three springs, two mixed controls, so you can go between that really wet, surfy, drippy sound and just having something nice, kind of more well-rounded, less maybe distracting, depending on the song. Um, and yes, if you kick it while you're playing, it will crash. It's pretty neat. The Surfy Bear Compact. I uh, want to thank Surfy Industries for their paid so sponsor spot. Uh, we donated the money from their sponsorship spot to uh, a few local bail funds. So uh, thank you again, Surfy Industries, for helping us make that donation. And uh, the entirety of my half of the pitch for Surfy Bear is going to be simply spring. Boing. <laughs> boing, boing, boing. <laughs> that, that's all I have to contribute. Why don't I have a boing sound up here? I have <laughs> charge. Oh, I miss baseball. I think I've got yeah. enough slack on my microphone. I can walk it over to the uh, the spring door stopper to this room. But that don't sounds like a it. lot of effort and be a lot of a uh, lot of 
lot of noise. I'll edit and post. <laughs> um, so that was so that was my kind of off topic personal question. Um, thank you for indulging me. Uh, Emily always gets to do that with any guests from Ohio or that general part of the world. Which well, we've had a lot week. of. Like, we've had a lot of non California guests lately, so it's refreshing to have. Well, we had. We had Lance from Dogman Devices. He's in uh, in Oxford, Ohio, from Dayton, I think he said. And then we talked to Julia from Rat Boys, and she was in Louisville, but Louisville, but she had family in Dayton, so that's why. So that's two. That's two, Andrew. It's two. Well, it feels like <laughs> a lot. All right. We've had um, a lot more Californians. So the more on topic question is: we're kind of getting to the back stretch of the episode. Is uh, what's um, is going to be a two parter. Is one what's new? Because I feel like we managed to we just kind of jumped in this week, which has actually felt really cool. I really uh, like that. I don't. <laughs> Do you want to talk but, about what's what's new with you first, Andrew? I want to. No, I. I mean, I don't have anything terribly. I guess the only thing I could contribute there is um, getting ready to ship out a uh, a Fox Cairo pedal topper for a full tone pedal. <laughs> What? Uh, oh, like yeah. covering up the front of a full tone pedal. Yep. So that'll be fun. Uh, shout out to Jim Burns for working with me on this and being willing to to be my guinea pig on this project. And I'm very excited. The artwork for it looks awesome. Uh, one of the artists that we've partnered with uh, named Aaron Schmidt, he mocked up the artwork for it and it looks incredible. So that's my kind of what's new. Um, outside of that, nothing too terribly exciting. I've just been doing nothing productive and just noodling on my pedal board and through my new amp. What if you did a, sorry, what if you did a pedal topper for, if someone just took their old OCD and then uh, wiped off the art and then just wrote like the worst parts of that email that Mike Fuller sent to that woman? I mean, I could, but. I think that would be kind of funny. I will break into your house. <laughs> I mean, that's already going to go down in infamy, and I'm not feeling particularly strong about, you know, reproducing messages of hate. <laughs> Never buy my pedals. You don't deserve them. <laughs> that was strange in, oh my to every degree possible. Um, and so, you remember when – what was that um, – Chris, was it – oh, gosh. What was that really fine champagne that, like, Chris people Dan? like Diddy – yeah, and Chris then Dow. the guy who owns Crystal was like trashing on all these rappers for making his brand exceptionally famous. <laughs> like, oh, wow, that's like, geez, you must hate money. Wasn't capitalism supposed to cure racism? I guess it didn't do that. It's no. a bold move, Cotton. Let's see how it plays out. <laughs> um, no, so I, I really don't. Ball. Ball. <laughs> ball reference. Uh, so outside good. of. I mean, I don't have a whole lot to contribute to to what's new, but I want to hear uh, what's new specifically from Devon. Uh, and the follow up question to that is uh, to what's new is what's going to be new, what's upcoming? Because I, this entire episode, you've just exuded this. I'm on a roll with creativity and making some incredible things to share with the world, and I just I want to hear what's new and what's going to be new. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, um, I. You know, so still doing the the whole the whole demo thing, um, and you know, I'm I'm putting out my own music. You know, this is the first time this year that that's happening, and I'm shooting my own music videos and and, and everything like that. So it's um, it's extremely interesting. You know, like taking taking a lot of the things that I learned from doing pedal demos, the videos, you know, and applying that to, to other things, you know, and I've even picked up a job shooting freelance video for Fox 40, um, like because of oh, like, nice. yeah. So it's, so it's, so that's kind of, that's an interesting, um, it's an interesting thing. So it's, um, What's new is, I mean, it's not really anything. I guess it's all new for, for, for me because, you know, I've never put out any music. I've been a guitarist for so many other bands before. And, uh, 
I guess all of that is really what's what's new. It doesn't seem like it's an interesting thing. I mean, you can I can say it broadly, but you know, there's a lot of small things that are kind of you know included into the the process of of doing that for the for the first time. Um, and um, you know, like for for the music video that um, I'll probably be putting out this winter, it's done. I had to learn how to make you know, fake walls. I had to learn how to make uh, breakable plates and I had to, and I had to huh. learn, yeah, like how to light people that like the pr- appropriate way to, to light people. And, um, it's, it, it's an interesting thing. Like the whole, the entire arc of starting things on Instagram, um, putting a f- cell phone in front of me and strumming some chords to, to like the abilities in which I like I've gained from that, you know, and it's not necessarily something that's really easy to articulate, you know, it's like, but quite easily I can like reach back to the, to the moment, you know, easily that this whole thing kind of like, um, started snowballing for me. And it was because, um, Tom from Cooper effects reached out to me, um, he reached out to me and he said, I really love your videos. Um, you know, the blue gloves, everything. That's so cool. He was like, would you be interested in doing 30 seconds of content for, for Instagram for a gin loss? And I was like, someone wants to give me a pedal for these, for a video. (laughs) And I was like, yes, absolutely. But I wanted it to be good. So, it's, uh, I, I looked up, I had all of these ideas, you know, and that's the cool thing about being a musician is that like, when you're a musician, like there is, there's a, there's a, a rhythm of in, in, in life and in things that you, you understand. It's like, you always know where the one count is. It, it, it's, it's a weird thing yeah. for me to articulate, but like, and that, manifests itself in your life in weird ways and you're in your cooking the way you dress the way you mow the lawn you know like you you do things to a certain uh beat and i understood that so i knew that to do a video for for this guy i it had to be something good you know and i have no ex- meaningful experience doing video but i researched it and looked into it and got some stop motion stuff and figured out lighting and that video ended up doing so well on instagram that from there i got a bunch of other pedal companies who were like hey we'll send you a pedal if you start if you would you know give us some content if you would do this if you would do that and it got to a point to where like i i had got so much interest that I had to start charging and it was only I was charging as a deterrent because like I never wanted to say no to anybody you know Mm -hmm. and so then it that became a thing and then the more I started doing these videos with my little iPhone I started realizing like okay I'm this is this is good I'm I'm it looks good. It looks cool. But like, I mean, it could look better. And then I started researching, you know, uh, cinematography, just lo- learning about lighting and learning about all of these things and got a, got a really good camera. And then that started becoming fascinating and color and, 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 and everything. So it, um, <clears throat> it took me from doing this Instagram thing to, to, to then doing stuff on YouTube, then shooting videos for Fox and then shooting freelance videos. And then, you know, learning to make <clears throat> fake walls and breakable plates and um, creating wow. meaningful story arcs and and all of that, and, you know, it's just, uh, you know, that's why I said earlier, it's like, you know, I'm, I am the proof that it's like, you can go, you can, you can really have this if you want it. You can have it. I mean, just, I am I'm very, like, just the quality of every single one of your demo videos I've seen. I think I wrote about this in, in the in the Reverb article. There's something very movie-esque and dramatic about them. I'm really surprised to hear that you didn't work on on movies, that you're completely self-trained in that. It's astounding. Oh, yeah. And it's, and it's only by virtue of being, like, being a musician. Like, I think, like, a lot of musicians don't really, again, like, we... We fail to real because we live in the real world. We forget to realize that, like, 
there is something kind of otherworldly about who we are as artists. You know, we allow like uh, society's standards and norms to kind of like put us in this in this box, compartmentalize us without realizing that like, I mean, we're so much more. We're so much more. And it's and and when you realize but when you do realize that like you're capable of creating things at on a you know a much grander level you just no you're you're you have the capacity to create seemingly from nowhere when you have that like you can create anything i didn't know that i would be good at doing videos i had no idea i didn't know i would be a good guitarist but because i was a good musician or because I understood where the one count was, when it came time to doing the videos, I knew that there was a sort of pacing to, 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 to making the videos. Like, you know, you want the, you want this type of shot. You really only want it to be there for that kind of long. Like, how do you know that? It's just like, it's just like, you know, that the, the bridge section on this song, you only want it there or how we know, like, um, a real dissonant chord. It's like, yeah, you really probably only want to hear that for just one second. It's like, how do you know that? How do you, as a musician, get in a room, uh, as a guitarist specifically, get in a room with a drummer, a piano, a bass player, a singer, and everyone know where the one count is? You know, mm-hmm. like, you know, it's established initially with the drummer, of course, but like right after that four count, everyone knows where the one count is. How does that happen? You know? And it's like, we all arrive to that echelon together. And it's, um, when you, when you realize that there is something different about you and that you have access to things that others don't, you can utilize that in interesting ways, like in, in your life. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was, you know, it was video. I was able to bring that in there and uh, by virtue of that experience you know I'm learning more things with regard to cinematography and I want to go into making short films I want to I want to do things like that I, I want to make the soundtracks for them it's just you know if there's something there's something out there in the universe that kind of calls to all of us and I think that's why some of us kind of feel like restless or just Un, like, unfulfilled and unsatiated it's because we are not willing to surrender to it you know surrender like you know it's just yeah we allow again society's norms to dictate what we should be doing you know you know swim up current you know you have to work really hard for this and you have to you have to have this house you have to have these this car you have to have this you have to do this life has to be this way you know but that's for them. That's for them. That was not, that's not for us, you know, like, and especially in times like right now with the social uh, level of social unrest, it's like, as an artist, you have the responsibility to, to create. When we think about like, and slightly getting off topic, but still on topic. When you think back to like the civil rights movements, right? uh, That from a historical standpoint, that just happened, you know, like that just happened ah. As for our generation. That's something we can easily reach back to, even though we didn't experience it ourselves. We weren't those born Those people there. are all still alive. They're still Some here. Of those, exactly. those, those, young, those young girls who were the first people to go to be integrated into white schools, they just turned like 65 years old. That just happened. But like the textbooks that um, the textbooks that kind of recount those actions have changed a thousand times over in our lifetime, just in our lifetime, right? But the one thing that has not changed since then is the arts that came from from that time. And that's the truest depiction of what happened then. In fact, like we listen to the to the music from those times and we still hum them today. We look at the artists and the painters and things like that. And those paintings are still hanging on walls in fact like we do everything in our power to make sure that those paintings survive so as an artist it's like there is no greater imperative there's no greater responsibility it's like if you want to be a social if a freedom fighter if you want to be out there cool you can do that you have to but like there exists another opportunity as well 
you know, and, and that is to create, put things out there. Even if you put it out there and like only 15 people listen to it, like it, you know, like who knows what will happen in 20 years from that. Like, I mean, I, I think about, I think about my, um, uh, I think about what is his name? It's, I'm always terrible when it comes to names of things. Um, Edgar Allan Poe, right. Who never really knew great fame. I mean, he had some small marginals fame in his lifetime, but he, he died believing that he was a, a failure. He died believing he was a failure. And it wasn't for years and years later that he was regarded as like one of the greatest uh, writers, um, you know, uh, of all time. I mean, he's, yeah. he's or Van and Gogh that, even. Exactly. You know, like it's, it, there exists our, our immortality, you know, but also too, like beyond that, like the greatest historians are, are, are the arts are are artists, you know? So mm-hmm. yeah. Wow. I'm not sure where I was going with all of that. I'm sorry, but it's like, I don't yeah, know, but know. that was, that was a great journey. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was like, what are you talking about now? But yeah. Uh, yeah so that, <laughs> whatever that is. Yeah. I, I, I feel like that, that, yeah. Do your music, release it now. Stop waiting. <laughs> Yeah, stop waiting. Get don't, tired of don't waiting. Wait. Yeah. Don't wait. There's like, gosh, there's some things, yeah, like like from very personal perspectives, like it feels, you're all, if you're always waiting for a better time to do things, I don't think you're ever going to find it. It's like people saying, and I've said it, like, I don't, I don't, I don't think right now is a great time to have a kid, but is there ever a good time to have a kid? Like, there may be better times, but is there ever a good time? Is there ever really a bad time? Or it's a little different than art, but like my, my, my band just uh, keeps delay. Like we, it's production delays. We're ready. We've been ready to release this music since February and it's going to happen. But yeah, I, I get tired of waiting. (laughs) Yeah. You know, it's like they say, you know, sometimes the, the smallest uh, step in the right direction ends up being, you know, the, the biggest step of your, your life. So it's like, you know, you, you, yeah. you want to, you know, tiptoe if, if you must, but, you know, take, take the steps, you know? So, yeah. and <clears throat> situations will never be perfect. You know, we allow those, those social norms to kind of uh, infect the way we, we think about things like what perfection is, what normal is you know, but like those rules don't necessarily apply to us. I mean, they do. Like, I mean, we're real life people living in the real world, but like, you know, there's, there's something else that exists within us that really, that we have to honor and surrender to as, as well, you know, so there's never going to be a good time for anything. You know, there's, it's, Mm -hmm. it's, the music will never be perfect. Your art will never be perfect. Your financial situation will never be perfect. Um, Knowing that though, knowing that it'll never be perfect. Mm -hmm. You still have to risk it all because if you love this thing, if you really love it, if you love it, if you love the arts and, like you love, like you love a child, like you love a family member, like you love someone who you would sacrifice everything for, then you would sacrifice everything for this, for cultivating this thing. So it's, 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 it's imperative that artists of all mediums now know that like, you know, the greatest sacrifice that we can make is putting something out there that we're unsatiated with. That's part, that's, that's one of the biggest steps that any of us can make for, for the artist, because in our minds, we're like, it's gotta be perfect. It's gotta be like this. It's gotta be, I have to find satiation in this song before I release it. But then you have to ask yourself, who are you, who are you doing this for? You know, like if you're making music for yourself, then just hang out in your garage and strum your guitar and that should be fine. You should find satiation in that. But if you can't find satiation, it's because you're making music for people. You're making music to what? Share, right? So share it. (laughs) Share it. Hell yeah. (laughs) 
Sure. I gotta say, I feel extremely, extremely energized listening to you talk. I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna make. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, make do that. That's and that's that's the point of all of this is make share it. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot to tell you that we bleep swear words with cat meows. <laughs> oh, okay, that's good. Good. That'll be like fun. That. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. I'm just yeah. basking in the in everything you just said, and I don't have anything. I could possibly add to that. And I don't want to talk. I don't want to follow that. <laughs> uh, well, no, no, it's no. great. <laughs> yeah, you guys, no, are, you guys, like, are, um... guys are real funny people. You guys are funny though. Like it's, it's. Oh, thank you. You guys have like an interesting, like a uh, kind of chemistry. Very radio, I would say. <laughs> not a, not shock jock radio. I hope. <laughs> no, no. It's always funny. Every every guitar podcast has a different vibe, and there are a few that kind of just remind me a little bit of like, not car talk, but like shock jock stuff, like with the sound effects. <laughs> you know, like uh, like this one <laughs> or this one. <laughs> and it was a, How would you have felt if I just started life. playing you off? <laughs> <laughs> that is that really is like the the okay it's time to <laughs> the playing somebody off music like, yeah. okay, bye. <laughs> like, it's funny oh man yeah, yeah we're on to the show to tell embarrassing stories and you're getting all personal we're just gonna play you off now come on <laughs> embarrassing stories you're the only one with emba- i don't get i get embarrassed so much i yeah i've like refilmed entire demos because i didn't like the way my hair looked or my pants were <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've got. I mean, I guess you could say I have embarrassing stories. I typically just call them stories. <laughs> this, you like, oh, yeah. hold up, hold up, hold up. There you go. Aww. Is that what you wanted? It seems like uh, that's what you wanted. It's not exactly what I was going for, <laughs> but I mean, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I, yeah. It's just I feel like the sign of a good conversation. I don't know. I don't know. I'm still ruminating on everything you just said, but like, I really liked the points about how the history books change, but the art really remains the same. And just how like we remember things differently or incorrectly, like little, like things like Martin Luther uh, King Jr. was not universally loved in his lifetime. I mean, he had a very low approval rate. The CIA called him the most dangerous man in America. And now we, I think probably rightfully look back at, you know, all, all the, the good he did, but it, it, it's not how it was in history. That's just how we look back on it. And I think we can still look back on, like you said, the music of that time, it's still widely regarded, uh, well regarded today. People still sing those songs. People still sample those songs, um, and with some, with few exceptions, like it's, nobody looks back on that and cringes, especially like some of, I don't know. I, I really could do with never having to hear the song, the ballad of the green beret again, but, uh, <laughs> do you know that song? I've heard it. Yeah. It's so, how was that a hit song? Or, um, I think I talked about this song before on the podcast, there was a hit country song in 1960, like a top 10 hit country song called Sun Don't Go Near the Indians. It's somehow worse than the title implies. How is, how could it be worse? It is. It's so bad. I don't know. I don't, I don't, how? I think how is that a hit song? I mean, Sorry, yeah. Country music was weird in the 60s. It was often good, like Marty Robbins, love, blah, 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 blah. Only in the 60s? Uh, a, um, <laughs> so. Jesus. <laughs> so I, I'm thinking about uh, I'm kind of, I I was going to say I'm marinating on what you just said but that's probably just because Ruminating. I'm hungry um, yeah I'm just going to marinate I, in I, it I'm, I'm pondering uh, in, a, in a less food related way and yeah. it, it's reminding me so I, I'm a religious guy and it's reminding me of, of this concept in um, of we're created as human beings one in the image of God 
Um, and two is one of our deepest desires is to know and to be known. And as I'm listening to you kind of talk about like that, that inner driving purpose and what you're doing things for and the self revelation that comes with music and how beautiful all of that is, I'm just finding myself called back to that, to that concept and re- religious or not for anyone listening. I mean, I, I think that I don't think that I don't think the desire to be known is exclusive to religion. I don't think it's exclusive to religion. No, I think that's a, a fairly universal concept. That's just that that's my my jumping point for where I get that from and how my at least my starting po- point for how that informs my worldview, uh, my perspective mm-hmm. on that kind of look. Um, yeah. Go ahead. And the fear of being misunderstood at the same time. Uh, yeah, you know, and it's uh, far t- far too often we we like you know when you when you get to a point and i think the biggest problem that we make as as, as human being is is constantly like labeling labeling things and making certain things exclusive you know to to a certain group or a certain practice without realizing that like we should all have those things you know like a, a lot of um moral stances that you find in the in the in, in the bibles and, and and even in the quran um you 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 realize that like these are things that we we do do already you know regardless of of what you what you believe you know like you know these things they embody us as well um you know so and i we do we only do a disservice to ourselves in creating these barriers that separate us creating things that like um are exclusively for for them you know it's just uh, division is the greatest evil that exists within humanity and even amongst artists of course but like far too often these paradoxical situations are you know in, injected into our social norms, you know, and these situations, by their very nature, have facts on either side of perspectives, you know, and no clear solution. So instead of us as a society trying to arrive at an echelon to where we talk about solutions, where we compromise, we argue over perspectives, you know. And, um, and that's fine. I mean, it's not fine. I mean, but that's how they, that's kind of more or less how they get us. And I don't want to sound like a, you know, but they, you know, I, I say they in lieu of saying like either the government, the one percenters, or by virtue of this machine that we ourselves have created, they, this is what they do and how they keep us, you know, under their thumb is by creating, you know, division, you know, so, and and I think it, and I kind of, as a music, as a musician, as artists, as we are, you know, it's like, we have to, we have to realize that like, in very much, in so many ways, yes, we're, we're there and living in the, the real world, but in a lot of ways, we're kind of apart from that, you know, because when you look back on like the, even the civil rights movements and things like that, and you see how like, you know, white bands had black artists with them, black musicians with them for the time, you know, and even before that, you know, but they were able to kind of like, there existed that fraternity of, of commonality of creating regardless of what like their social standings were and regardless of what their perspective was uh, regarding other races, you know, like I've been in rooms with people who like should not like each other, but because we're musicians, <laughs> because we have this thing in common, you know, like we have this and that makes that unites us in, in, in a way that like a lot of the, the social dogmas and, you know, practices would never um, allow for. Um, so, you know, it's, I don't know. Division is one thing. Um, it exists. It will always exist. Um, but, you know, artists have to still kind of, kind of just still create. You know, like, right. No, I think it's, uh, 
I, I would agree in going as far as to say it's a moral imperative. Oh yeah. Oh yes. I think it, I really, I think it is, you know, like I see on social media and I don't ever, I, I never, um, I never put my political or religious values out there on social media. I mean, I, I'm all for having a, a chat with close friends or, or anyone in my DMs who want to who ask my viewpoint on certain things. I'm okay with doing that, but I won't put it out there. But like you, you get to see though, has how many artists, you know, are like voicing, you know, their perspectives with things. And that's important. Like, yeah, sure. Voice your, your opinions on, on, on these, these truths or these needs, but like still create. man. like, we got a responsibility. We got to pull double duty. Yeah. We, we have to make sure that we're still, standing up for social inequities and things like that but like you have you still have to create like especially in times like this man it's so important to create it like if you have it in you to create something that appropriately reflects these times do it and put it out because like in 20 years like who knows what society will do to to this you know like to what we're mm-hmm. what, what's happening in the world right now they may change it all like you know and and it's um yeah so i think yeah I, I i do worry about what his history books are gonna are gonna say about different things i mean they tend to oversimplify things for sure but yeah. uh yeah you can see the complexities in the art yeah 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 that's yeah. I think that's where it's true. And because a song is has a has a catchy chorus, you know, regardless of what people believe, you know, they're they're still gonna sing that song. You know, I just learned that um the popular ice cream uh the, the song that the ice cream trucks play was a racist song. Uh for, oh, Turkey in the Straw. N- no, a watermelon. It's a watermelon song. It was a, a watermelon song and it oh. was yeah, so the ice cream companies, <clears throat> yeah, like, uh, yeah, like one of those popular songs. I forget exactly which which one it is, but it's the most popular one, the most basic one you hear. It was a song. It was a song that they made um, for. It was, uh, it was some sort of water, watermelon song, and it was made specifically. Oh my god! Yes, for. I just, I'm for, sorry, I just looked up the lyrics. Wow, that is. Yeah. Yeah. Very racist. Yes, yes. That's not even a. That's not just a little bit racist. That's extremely racist. Oh my god! Right. So yeah, I'm, I just pulled up an NPR article from 2014 on this, and we're reading the same article. <laughs> the, oh my god! The editor's note is this article is about a virulently racist song. <laughs> Read no further if you wish to avoid racist imagery and slurs. And it just it it. Good God. Right. So it's it's funny how like that came out so long ago and it's and and, I mean, but, you know, that is therein lies like, you know, the opposite, the opposite, um, you know, what what while that is the proof that music uh, will last and because it's catchy, we we kind of give it a pass. That is that while that is the proof of that, you know, that also, too, is like, you know, shows that like it can be used for 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 evil as well um so it's you know it's but it hasn't changed you still hear it on ice cream trucks and they don't even know a lot of times like nine times out of ten they're like yeah this is catchy this is a catchy song i'm gonna, I'm gonna put this on we're gonna blast this and uh without knowing what it really means you know so oh man see i just thought it was turkey in the straw which is probably also not good <laughs> I don't, yeah. Oh, it seems to literally be about turkeys. So, <laughs> I don't know. It, I mean, just to be clear, like the written lyrics in it are kind of written in that dialect. That's like whoever wrote this was certainly racist. <laughs> <laughs> the implication is there. Yeah. I mean, anytime you have D E instead of T H E. In an yeah. old song, I think that that's probably a minstrel song, <laughs> and that's minstrel is like that's racist stuff too. 
Oy. Well. What, a, what a history we have that's barely even history at this point. I like how it has racist versions as if the original version doesn't seem pretty damn racist. <laughs> <I> like <laughs> the, the remix. Wow. Uh, wow. Imagine what that I uh, with the meeting with the uh, the record execs would have been like for that. You know, the equivalent was like, "Hey, so uh, we we like this song, but it, you got to make some changes, son. It's uh, it's not racist enough." Oh, not <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just watching thir- the documentary Thirteenth last night, and just oh my god, just so blatant the racism, and then it just like getting sneakier and sneakier and sneakier. It hasn't gone away. It's just gotten sneaky. Well, you know, Will Smith said something very interesting and, and, and profound, really. And he said that racism hasn't changed. It hasn't gotten worse. It hasn't gotten better. It's just being filmed now. And, yeah. um, but, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Police brutality, especially. Yeah. I mean, amongst <laughs> other things. I mean, I, I think the the wild thing to me is thinking about how significant the idea that it needed to have been filmed for people to start really taking it seriously and start believing it just kind of rattles my brain in, in, in ways that make me painfully aware of the the sort of privilege that I've got. And I, I just, that's, that hurts the empath in me. If I, if I can call back to that, uh, just thinking that like, if some any any number of these things had happened to me, like I wouldn't have even needed a video to get someone to believe me. And we've got this entire society that's finally just now coming around. And it just chunks of our society. It's going like, wait a minute, this has been happening. That's not okay. And then there's on the other side of that, there's still people going, oh well, we don't have all the facts. I'm like, it's on video. Are you kidding me? At right. a point, people just don't want to, they don't want to think about things, they don't want to believe them, and they don't want to change their own behaviors or have their own thought processes challenged. And I think that, I, I read someone said the other day that, you know, someone telling you that something that you're doing is racist, sexist, homophobic, um, it's an act of love when they're calling you out because it means they think that you have the capacity to change and that you want to. Yeah, it's 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 really a hard, it's it's a hard thing and I think the reason why like people tend to not believe certain accusations is because if you if you agree with those accusations then you're basically saying that like yeah, my people are like this. My my people are mean and hateful and do this it's it's a weird thing because like especially for our generation you know in particular where we weren't we none of us were brought up racist um for the most part and i mean it's being being racist you know for for our generation was wildly unpopular to 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 the point to where like you've got a lot of great you know closet racists and things like that but even so like um our generation weren't brought up to be that way and when when a when a white person hears that like um that one of their own is doing this then like they take it personally you know like they they yeah. kind of internalize it they make it it's 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 more like it's an assault on 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 them you know without realizing yeah. that you yourself are responsible for yourself you are an individual and you know like you know the fraternity that you that that you that you should dwell in is not necessarily the one that's dictated by your by your skin color you know it has nothing to do with you personally that there are people out there who tend to marginalize other people and and treat people unfairly but it is you it is yours as a as a as a as a as a moral human being to stand up for any atrocities that exist in the same sense that like if we're sitting at a dinner table and a big man stands up and punches a woman in the face like we're all going to be like hey man what are you doing we are going to fight for this woman we're going to do what we have to do like i mean that's that's part of the way that we were raised and we have to have the capacity to do that for small micro racism things you know like you're at a dinner table and a 
friend or a family member says something, you know, provocative, you know, with regard to race, you know, like in the same sense, it, since you would stand up for that woman, you should stand up for, for, for whomever. So it's just, it, we're just trying to get society, I, I guess, to the point to where realizing that like, you know, racism from a moral stance is, is, uh, is wrong. And we, we should kind of stand up for everybody equally, you know, it's the yeah. all rights matter. All, all lives matter. Black lives matter. It's, um, it's important to realize though, too, for the people who, who, who push for all lives matter, it's important to, for them in particular to realize that like, um, their point is valid and it's, it's, but it's like, all Lives Matter is the book, you know, is the title of the yeah. book. But Black Lives Matter is the chapter we're on right now, you know. And yes. Next yes. week, next week, next month, it'll be Hispanic Lives Matter. Sure, it can be Caucasian Lives Matter, Asian Lives Matter, you know. Native it's lives. just Native Lives Matter, especially them. Like, I mean, the things that are happening Jeez. to them yeah. in this country right now is just ridiculous. But, like... You know, do do the right thing because, like, something within you calls for you to do it, not necessarily because social media or, or anything like that or the media at large says that you need to do it. Do it because it's within you have the capacity to be a good person um, and, and do it for that reason alone because the, the reality is, is the media and politics – you know, they they will use our anger as a vehicle to fuel their own agendas. But that, if you're doing it for the right reason, then like it, it'll have a lasting effect on your lineage. And that's the most important thing. Like if you're, if you're of the age where you've got children or you want to have children, really the best thing that you can do for society is to instill a better sense of value in, into them. And, you know, and just do things for the right reason. Don't just do it for the sake of doing it. Just do it for yourself, I guess. You know. Yeah. Collectivism over individualism in some ways, too. Yeah. It's like, I'm sorry, I was reading one. What was that demo that you did where you read that poem? And it was, it talked about old, old men planting trees, the shade of which they'll never enjoy. Yeah, that's that one. I think um, the the original. So I think in 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 my poem and my my version of that poem, I said that um, I said it's a great thing indeed when old men when old men plant seeds for trees whose shade they will never need. Um, I think mm. the original version of it said something a little bit different, and it's it, it's a, a, a it's a Greek proverb or philosophy or quote. It's, it's original, some Greek one. And the wording is slightly different, but the meaning is the same that like, you know, you know how, you know, old men planting seeds and, and, and things like that. It's, it's like, we have to kind of realize, and I mean, even still, this goes back to the whole musician thing, being an artist thing that like, you know, like our responsibility is, is to create, you know, like in the same sense, like old men plant seeds for trees, you know, like they're never going to enjoy the shade from that tree, nor will they actually be able to enjoy the fruit that will bloom from, from said tree. They'll never enjoy that, but they do it because it needs to be done. They do it because others will be able to reap the benefit of it. And like as artists, there exists no greater responsibility they then to to create yeah do all of the other stuff that we're required to do pay your bills and you know stand up for whatever your political or ideological values are but at the same time man create because not everyone can do it you know like what is it in you that 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 you know was it by virtue of 
causality or you know some great angelic architect who who invested this in you whatever it was whatever it was or if it's just some sort of biological imperative that's pulled from like great your great lineage and then all of a sudden you have it regardless of whatever it is wherever it comes from you have to create in the same sense the old men plant seeds for for trees whose seeds Who's you know who's tr- they'll never enjoy the the fruit or the shade from those things, but they do it. So it's just we have to do that, you know. So yeah, man, just I don't know. It, and that's been something that's kind of been sticking in my my craw, like it just in me. That's it's just been in my in in my spirit since everything has is has has been happening and unfolding and just the terrible things happening. And like for a long time there, like creatively, I felt stifled. I didn't want to talk about petals, you know, when, when these terrible, horrific things were, were happening in the world. Like it seemed silly. It seemed silly. Talk about guitar petals, making videos and blue gloves and things like that and covering my hands. And I don't know. It seemed silly, but at the same time though, it took me a minute to realize that like there exists no greater responsibility than to deny, than to deny your purpose, regardless of circumstances, regardless to what's happening in the world. Like, again, I'm not saying that you should not be standing up for, for whatever your values are, do it, still do it. But, You've got the responsibility as as someone who was this was created in, like to to surrender to that as well. You have to create, yeah. you know. And um, it took me a long time to kind of like figure that out to like, you know, move past that within my myself, you know, because I didn't want to do anything. And then, um, yeah. and then I did, and then I started feeling 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 better about you know, the world at large and and realizing that like, you know, you, you may never, you may not have the effect, um, on society now with your art. It might just be something that like, much like Edgar Allan Poe, it might be something that will spark something in someone else. Like, I mean, even if, even if in your art, you save one person, you know what I mean? I say save in a broad term, like it can mean anything. You know, sometimes it may be like you're just, when you put something out there, like you're giving people just a break from like the, the harshness of reality. And that's the greatest gift that like artists have, you know, is to give the world a break from itself because it insists upon itself. But when you create things and you create this thing from the unknown, you put a certain amount of that energy into it and the rest of the world who sees it, who are patrons of the arts, they're afforded that, you know, the unknown. They, they're a, a, a void. They get a sense of what that is. And I believe wholeheartedly that there exists an energy in everything and somehow or another artist, we uh, we are in tune with, you know, said energy, like this this thing that we can do, you know. So right, right. Don't deny it. Yeah, just do it. <laughs> I mean, I, I definitely resonate. I mean, I, I, I'm a parent, and I resonate with that a lot as I'm kind of wrestling my brain, like, well, what is? How do I handle this well? How do I look at this? And, and the thought that I've had kind of in the last week is. Hearing all of these people um, cu- bring up this word heritage, and I'm sitting like it, it's a relatively agnostic word in and of itself, but the way it's been used is charged with it with some sort of a pride in the actions of people that have come before us and running with that. I mean, that, I, grew, I grew up around Southerners who would claim that as heritage, heritage, and even then. And it's just like just trash. It's it's a twofold. Well, it's a twofold thing because I'm sitting here thinking, like, okay, if that's of all the heritage in this country, I mean, is that going to be the one you're proud of? For one, and for two, thinking for myself, looking forward down the line, is like in terms of planting seeds. It reminded me of this: is when people a generation or two down from me are claiming the word heritage. What? What? How are they going to define it? 
And I, I'm kind of left with that kind of thought resonating in my head of how do I not necessarily retake the word for the sake of the word itself, but in, in, in terms of redefining what we want our ancestors to, to be proud of us for. And I think right now our, our country, mm -hmm. the people who are pulling the heritage card are really like, really that's, this is how you're going to play that card. All right. I mean, bold move cotton, but it's not going to play out and <laughs> dodgeball. <laughs> Oh, so, different one. It seems so, so silly for them to be pulling this card right now, it, and I'm so confused as to what part of that they're they're prideful in, and not confused in in as much as I'm not sure they're being honest in what parts they're prideful in. I think the rest of us are seeing right through the, the nonsense, going, "Uh huh, sure, that's the part we all know that you're just prideful about the racism," and I I don't want that to be the the way that heritage is used years down the road. And I think artists have. A, a unique ability to help redefine what that legacy is moving forward for our mm -hmm. generation. I think that's the potential behind that brings chills and goosebumps. Uh, the right. idea that we, we as artists have that capability to hijack that entirely for the greater good. Oh yeah, definitely. You know, and, and you know, and I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I too, am a, a, a parent and I've got a little, a little guy and uh the stepdaughter and it's uh it's like uh the so, sometimes the best thing that we can do you know um one of course obviously you know create put stuff out there but at the same time like you have to fully like educate uh, and that's the one thing is unbiasedly educate and i think that's one of the things that like um, our par parents of this generation didn't necessarily do for us because they themselves were like, we're not racist people. We're just trying to live our lives. But in one hand, that's our greatest strength because a lot of us don't really necessarily like see color. It's just there's just people out there. We're just living. Um, but at the same time, though, especially um, for, for for whites, because you weren't brought up racist or brought up in a racist home, you don't really know what like those small micro racism things are. You don't know what what it means what, when someone has a when someone at, when you're at a dinner table and someone says something you know that's racist and whatever you you kind of give it a, you give it a pass. You're like, yeah, my uncle, he's just whatever. But like the best thing we can do for our children is to completely inform them of the state of things and let them know in the same sense, again, going back to what I said earlier, in the same sense, we teach our children to stand up for like certain injustices or certain like, you know, like moral imperatives. Like we have to make, you know, races, racist things. We have to let them know that like, this is not okay. You know, and for a lot of, and that's, and I think that that's where a lot of white people kind of are having a problem with nowadays is because their parents didn't tell them like, Hey, that's not okay. They just didn't tell them anything. And they think yeah. that like, I don't, I'm not a hateful person. I love everybody. Like, you know, it, and it, it's just, we were done. We were kind of done a wrong and, and a right at the same time. Um, I think that the intentions were probably good, but right. just it didn't get there. No, they had no way of knowing. They had no way right. of knowing. And the situations here in America have kind of created a perfect storm. You know, there's the there was the fact that like we ourselves weren't really appropriately taught. Uh, about racism um we weren't we weren't taught it so we don't know what it looks like and we didn't understand that certain the landscape of things were changing we didn't know that from an education standpoint they were changing the books and we did you know they were kind of like watering down a lot of things that had happened and we didn't know our parents didn't know that it would changed like this we, we didn't know that the that the police would operate in the way that they are operating we we didn't know that that would happen and so it was hard for them to kind of like have that kind of foresight when parenting they just thought teach our children to love and that's and that's enough and and it's a beautiful sentiment and in, in a way 
it it did help. It has helped because you've got now a lot of, you know, white people who are open to the idea that like, yeah, this was wrong. We need to stand up for this. And if and so to our parents' credit, um they did give us the tools to 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 realize that like we should all equally be on the same playing field and you know we have to we kind of have to address these situations so i mean there is a lot of good that's kind of came from what that generation has left us but at the same time now we're realizing that for our generation the greatest gift we can live for the the greatest thing we can do is to prepare the next generation. And that comes by educating them unbiasedly, you know? So, Mm -hmm. and again, creating, if you're an artist, you know, like do that too. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I appreciate the, the positivity you see in, in what uh, our parents' generation tried to instill in, in, in that sense. And I think my, my challenge to folks who, resonate with that is when you when you hear the when you start hearing the examples of how the 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 world that you thought existed doesn't really exist that way um yes the answer should be okay well how do we fix this and i what i'm seeing a lot of people do is it's a knee-jerk reaction of no uh that's not that's not the the world as i understand it and it kind of kicks back into a i don't want to accept that um this kind of general sentiment that everything that i've known is a lie and kind of just shell up and uh and just kind of try to shut it all out and i guess what i would want to see less of i don't want to see that i want to see people respond in a okay well this is the world that i thought that existed that sounds really cool but now i'm seeing all of the ways in which that doesn't really work that way my response is i want to deconstruct that and i want to to rebuild a a, the world that i thought existed well i Uh, mean and that's and that's and that's a that's a beautiful thing. I think the reason why most people don't arrive at that echelon is because like the the way that social media the the, the just the the way social media like ensures that there's always going to be something that supports your narrative. Like I mean if you think about it like the internet every website you go go on charts you know you know cookies and and things like that and it'll advertise to you where you've been if for for a lot of americans specifically white americans who who have like a lot of conservatives in their family you think like think about it like this so for facebook for example right you you friend all of your family member right and if all of your family members they're they're conservatives they're you know and they're big Donald Trump fans, you're going to see that in your feed a lot, you know, and the, the way the cookies, the cookies on the internet work and stuff like that, it's going to keep showing you more of that. Uh, every, any other sites you go on, you know, it's going to show you things related to, to that. Everywhere you go, there is now something that supports your narrative, the way you want to live your life, advertising it is based off of where you've been on the internet so it keeps giving you this right so you continually have justification for your narrative there exists nothing else so that's why we have so many people who have hardline stances who people who believe that no this is the world i live in because guess what it very much is the world that they live in this goes back to what i was saying earlier that like whoever it is if if it's the media if it's if it's the government if it's the one percenters of the one percenters or even by virtue of the machine that we've created these paradoxical situations are 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 interjected injected into our, our our mainstream lives and on opposite on every side of this thing that's been put in here there's facts to support every perspective you know um so we argue over perspective, you know, like we, we, without arriving at an echelon of like compromise, you know, none of us say that, like, none of us want to say that, like, I understand why white nationalists have this perspective. We think that in saying that we understand it, we give justification to it. Like it's, 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 it's important to, to understand that there are a certain amount of facts 
on either side of these arguments. There are, and we lean on them. You know, we lean on them heavily, and the Internet just kind of keeps continually giving us things that support this lifestyle. And then you've got these people on opposing sides saying, I don't understand why these people don't see this point. I don't understand why they don't see this point. I just saw this. I read this thing, and it popped up on, on YouTube. A video popped up on YouTube explaining this, and I don't understand why they don't understand these facts. But, like, the system is designed to to, to – it's designed to keep you like social media is designed to keep you there longer. So it gives you things based off of what you've seen or based off of the things that your people, people, your friends and family seen like suggested things, right. you know, so it's I mean, like, it's, a, it's an echo chamber. Victim. Exactly. And, exactly. And it's amazing. It's amazing how quickly someone can become radicalized on uh, social media and just from other kinds of similar media. Like I have a friend who her whole life has been liberal and uh, feminist and all this stuff. And all of a sudden, like I'm seeing tweets that she likes and they're like Tucker Carlson and Jordan Peterson and really like uh, alarming kind of how quickly this happened. This happened over the period of a month and a half. All right. And it's, you know, you think back to like to, to Nazi Germany, you know, when Hitler, uh, you know, indoctrinated a lot of the just the, the, the Germans to his side. Like when you really think about it, did everybody he, he pulled in, did they all have like an innate interest in like, you know, killing Jewish people and, and doing the, the terrible things, boiling people? You know, that the weird like you he had an entire army of men who were devoted to his cause, to his narrative, and they themselves didn't all innately have it. It was not built into them. But like because it was what they seen and continually saw and it was because he spoke so so beautifully and with you know, uh like they And they, they had fear it. and they were doing yep. poorly economically and it's just like all of this uh if I, I I again just watched thirteenth last night, just playing how playing off of people's fears created this whole prison industrial complex. People were afraid and making them more afraid is you know how the 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 right has traditionally won elections it's been yeah, but- largely like i just want to be safe and i want my family to be safe and then playing off of these kind of implicit biases that people have especially of you know black and brown people well and i would say the the the, the fear aspect definitely plays to both sides of the aisle um in terms of wanting to to be safe um and fearing for the safety of your family. Exactly. And that's, that's 100% it. Like, you know, there's, there's, there are great things that have happened from the right. There are great things that have happened from the left. We, we, where we go wrong is in, in believing that one is one exclusively is right. And one is, and, and that's the same thing. It's the same thing with religion. It's the same thing with anything of value is putting is, is, is segregating. It is like saying that this, thing entirely alone apart is good without realizing like when we make when we when we make those arguments like the right does this and the left does this like therein lies again arguing perspectives instead of talking about what the solution is and here's an interesting thing though too like um republican republican and conservative values are inherently values that have always been instilled into African Americans. It wasn't until like uh, the era of Nixon that things more or less kind of changed. Malcolm X said something extremely interesting in an interview in the 60s. A reporter asked him, what do you think? Don't you think it's great what the Democrats are doing for, for, for for the black man in America? And Malcolm X said plainly, there is no difference between the Democrats and the Republicans in America. He says, the only difference between them is the Democrats have gotten better at lying to to the black man. But make no mistake, we are all, all of us, pawns on a board to be shuffled about. And he said, he said that about Democrats. And 
I, I never knew why he said that or what the meaning was for it. But when you actually go back and study the history, it was Democrats that actually um, it was it, it was the Democratic movement that actually funded, you know, the, uh, the, the the Confederates during the Civil War. And it wasn't until like the the Nixon era that they became more popular. They became like liberal and and things of that nature. But like. To say that, and I'm neither. If if anyone's interested, I'd never try to tell people what I am or anything like mm-hmm. that. I'm 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 neither. I'm just some some guy who plays with guitars, and it's <laughs> uh yeah, and it's just we have to realize though, even as artists, that we are somehow a we are not a we're not always altogether a part of all of that. You know, like it's I mean, we are in the sense that like we're real life people living in the real life world and we have to, you know, be good to one another. But like we have to make sure that we don't allow like those type of opposing narratives to interject themselves too much in in, in us and what we do. Like, I mean, it's just, yeah, but like but at the same time, though, too, you have to kind of put a cap on it. You have to realize that like. You know, there is no one truth. People say that there is one truth, but in most of these situations that are interjected into society, they're done so because, like, they they want us to argue over these things. And they've done it since the Roman Empire, you know. Yeah. During the Roman Empire, people who were starving on the streets, impoverished, and being overtaxed, you know, the, the Roman Empire realized that the only, that they realized that, like, the, that the people outnumbered the politicians and even the armies, like you know, two or three to one. They realized that if the people uprose, then like, then they would be like shit. They would be crap out of luck. So what they what they did was they gave them the gladiators. They gave them something to fixate on, you know. And while some people sided with the gladiators, you know, like the uh, you know, and, and then some sided with them, and then they, you know. But that was what they did, and they were able, they were successful for a few, you know, hundred years um, doing that, you know. And um, the only reason why, like, they were eventually overtook was because, like, they kind of became complacent and not complacent. They just they kind of came became too full of themselves like this is enough what we've given them this is enough this will keep them but now it's like as a society like the the reason why like they still keep us they still got us is because like they're constantly interjecting new things covid now we're arguing over covid and, and then now race relations we're arguing over that and before that it was you know like it, it was just we're being hit with so many things so often that it's just you can't be bored with any with it i mean you can not bored i'm sorry that's that's such the that's a wrong word it's just we can't we are never afforded a break to just unite it's just create more opposition is created and then another one and then another one and then another one and then another one we appreciate and value your opinion and really appreciate you uh, taking the time out of the morning. We are like an hour past what our normal format is. And I think <laughs> <laughs> I've yeah, been happy to have the conversation. <laughs> it's been nice to talk to people for sure. What? Oh, I miss intelligent conversations with, with real human <laughs> beings for sure. You guys can. Thank you, you guys so are going to edit this in post, right? Like you guys can probably chop off most of this. Like I think – Oh, I usually set it for cross. <laughs> I'm sure I usually just set it for cross talk and swear words and then And then removing me from the episode entirely, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> that one's pretty easy. Right. That's just deleting a track. <laughs> Fastest edit ever to improve an episode. Thank you so much for being on the show. We really appreciate it. Um thirty seconds or less, where can people find you and your art? Um, so you can find me at Devon Blue Whitaker on uh, both Instagram uh, and YouTube for for demos. If you're interested in what my music is like, you can find me on Spotify and Apple Music, iTunes as uh, Boy 
uh, Indigo. So that's where I'm at. Nice. All right. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. It's been a lovely conversation. Um, left me a lot of uh, words to marinate in now that we're getting closer to lunchtime. I'm thinking to go eat something and uh, <laughs> continue to sit on that. To, uh, to yeah. all of our listeners, uh, we've got a Patreon. Please consider su- giving us even just a dollar a month would make a huge difference. We'd really appreciate it. Uh, also, five dollars out- is more helpful. Even <laughs> <laughs> uh, and for five, I think it's five dollars you get into the super secret patron chat. Right, right. And uh, write us a review on iTunes, buy some merch, follow us on Instagram, all the good stuff you know what to do. Thanks for listening. Thanks for understanding. My name is Andrew. I'm Emily. Bye. Bye. Ticket, Michelle.